So please join me in welcoming tonight's panelists. We have Dr. Evelyn Cusack and Dr. John Detien to our panel. Dr. Cusack is a cardiologist and director of the Women's Heart Program at Stanford Health. She's also an active member of the Go Red movement and well-known in the health lecture circuit series. John is a physical therapist at HSS and Stanford Health. It's a HSS sports rehab specifically. On top of receiving his doctor of physical therapy degree, he's also a certified yoga instructor and a group fitness instructor. Welcome everyone. My name is Evelyn Cusack. Um, I'm a cardiologist here in Stanford. I've been here in Stanford for the last uh, 15 years. So I'm old, um, but welcome. And I think it's such an important uh, topic to talk about. I think it gets overlooked, particularly when you see a cardiologist. Um, the title of my talk today is Chronic Stress, is chronic. Health Distress. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Next slide. So back in 1948, they started the World Health Organization. And, you know, obviously, stress has been an important thought for many years, decades. And they came up, this is the preamble to the Constitution of the World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And so that really harkens to the idea that stress is harmful to the health um, and well-being of, of humans. So uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. So what is stress? Stress, oh, next slide, I'm sorry. Um, state, that stress is the state of a mental or emotional strain or tension resulting in an, from adverse or very demanding circumstances. And there is physiological and hormonal response to stress. Um, when we get, uh, when we're in a stressful situation, be it physical or mental, our brain reacts. And with that, the pituitary gland um, stimulates and, and gives off ACTH, which is also known as adrenocorticotropin hormone, which then stimulates the adrenal glands to elevate cortisol levels, adrenaline levels. And in turn, those hormones influence the liver the blood vessels, we have increased glucagon and glucose, uh, we increase blood pressure, increased sweating, increased rate of breathing, um, our heart rate accelerates from the adrenaline. Normal stress, what normal stress is motivational, it's goal-oriented, it gets projects done, it gets us out of harm's way. We, our, our, our blood vessels uh, constrict, our heart rate goes up, our vision focuses so we can get out of harm's way, but chronic stress is maladaptive. It has long-term health consequences. So with all these stress hormones that are elevated, chronically elevated hormones increase blood pressure over time, increase inflammation. It actually increases cholesterol and glucose. And in turn, all of these changes increase the risk of heart disease, arrhythmia, diabetes, stroke, depression, and even cancer. Um, actually, um, cancer, it's just a specific on that one. Um, people that are primary caregivers to Alzheimer's patients have twice the risk of developing non-small cell lung cancer. So we can see daily stress absolutely impacts cancer, um, which is a surprise to a lot of people. Um, next uh, slide, please. So how does, blood, how does uh, stress increase blood pressure? Elevated cortisol levels, Elevated adrenaline levels cause inflammation and constriction of blood vessels. It raises um, blood pressure, damaging these blood vessels. As you can see, there's blood vessels throughout the entire body. They're in the brain, they're in the heart, they're in the arteries. And what happens is this adrenaline spikes, our blood vessels constrict, our blood vessels, our blood pressure goes up. And you can see there's an increase in vascular tone. Our blood vessels are smaller. And what can happen is over time with this constriction, it damages these blood vessels and it also damages the organs that they supply, such as the brain, the heart, and the kidneys. So this is all interrelated from the increase in the cortisol and the adrenaline levels from the, the stress response. Hypertension talking. So when we see this, our ideal blood pressure, so getting back to the, the cardiovascular part of this, hypertension um, is considered a blood pressure that is chronically over 120 over 80. As I said, high blood pressure damages and inflames the blood vessel walls. So uncontrolled or poorly controlled blood pressure cause can lead to heart failure, stroke, and kidney failure. 
And as we age, blood vessels start to stiffen and high blood pressure is common. So when you add chronic stress to this, this whole situation is exacerbated. I have so many patients that come in and their blood pressure elevates when they're in the, in the stressful situation of being in a doctor's office, or they say, you know, I've been going under a lot of stress. It is absolutely seen and observed that this is a, a, a very known entity and a, and a very close relationship. So how do we do this? How do we manage this? Well, first step is to make some lifestyle changes. Obviously, low sodium we talk about and uh, moderate intensity daily exercise, weight loss, but stress management is also a key component that I think, unfortunately, is not well understood, not well addressed at most doctor's offices. Half of the adults in the United, United States have poorly controlled high blood pressure. And sometimes, despite our best efforts of lifestyle and stress management, we may need medications. Next slide, please. Um, the stress hormones that we talked about, the cortisol, the, um, the adrenaline, well, also chronic stress elevates glucose, it elevates insulin. It also elevates this hormone called, called HGMA-CoA reductase. And what that is, it's a, it's a hormone that's closely associated with cholesterol. Um, all these hormone eleva uh, elevations in make insulin less effective, which causes insulin resistance. So you can see chronic stress elevates insulin, elevates cholesterol. Also, it causes a sleep deprivation because when you're under chronic stress, we tend to sleep poorly. That also changes our, we get more interested in eating a higher carb diet. So all of these things are interrelated. Next slide, please. So as we talked about, and you see that um, pretty impressive slide, it, stress hormones elevate glucose, cortisol, insulin and increase insulin resistance. These things are related to the development of diabetes. Also weight gain. When people are under stress, they tend to gain weight, most of us. Um, it's either through poor diet, but a lot of times it's through these hormonal changes that occur with the chronic daily stress. Increased cortisol and adrenaline also increases that inflammation that we talked about, which causes vascular damage, which also elevates blood pressure and the increase in HGMA-CoA reductase, which by the way, you might have ever heard about this, but HGMA-CoA reductase is the hormone that statins inhibit. So when you have elevated HGMA-CoA reductase levels, that elevates cholesterol, that elevates triglycerides. These, these, this cholesterol is attracted to our blood vessels that are inflamed, causing um, blockages. Next slide, please. So we talk about stress and then we say to ourselves, well, you know, if you look around, 80% of the heart attacks in this world are caused by nine factors. I highlighted the ones in red that are related to the stress hormones. Now, smoking, obviously, we all know that you shouldn't smoke, not even a little bit. So let's just get off of that. No smoking at all. But diabetes. That's a risk factor for heart disease. Well, we just talked that diabetes can be influenced by these stress hormones. These stress hormones increase the risk of developing diabetes. Hypertension, again, the, the, we can elevate blood pressure with stress. These are cardiac events, obesity. We talk about how stress hormones can make us gain weight. Um, also, stress is it, it impacts our physiological well-being. Impaired physical, logical well-being stress absolutely has an impact on the development of coronary disease and coronary events, heart attacks, strokes, poor diet. We talked about that. Lack of exercise, alcohol consumption. These are things that are lifestyle. So we're not going to get into that with stress. But high cholesterol, as we just said, can be impacted by those stress hormones when we have under stress, over time, it can elevate our cholesterol by in, in impacting that HDMA co-reductase. Next slide, please. So with all this information, how stress hormones impact our cholesterol, our blood pressure, diabetes, weight, what, and we know that these factors increase the risk of developing coronary artery disease. Let's talk about what coronary artery disease is. So what you're looking at here is the heart. The heart has three major blood vessels and the branches. Think about it as the plumbing to the heart. So inside these blood vessels, blood pressure 
if it's high, can inflame those and damage those blood vessels. We talked about inflammation. We talked about high blood pressure. Then cholesterol, when we have high cholesterol, it's attracted to those areas of, of, of inflammation and cholesterol can start building up inside, clogging these pipes. And then over time, it can cause a significant narrowing or sometimes under stress, it can also rupture. So you can see the development of the this plaque buildup when it becomes critical that and then blood flow will stop and that's what causes a heart attack or heart damage like i said damage the blood vessel wall you get this cholesterol and, and platelets are attracted to the areas of inflammation and plaque builds up a ruptured plaque can cause a heart attack same process for the brain. So what's going on in the heart, those blockages can cause strokes. So when you have a stroke, it's a reduced blood flow to the brain. When you have reduced blood flow to the heart, it can cause a heart attack. Same process, high blood pressure, stress, cholesterol, inflammation, reduced blood flow, causing damage to the brain. Next slide, please. Um, and, I'll and another thing that can happen under stress, and I don't know if you've heard about this, is called the broken heart syndrome. And the broken heart syndrome is a when a sudden severe emotional or physical stress that causes a rapid heart failure or weakening of the heart muscles. Um, it's typically in the setting of a very um, unusual stressor, like the loss of a loved one or a very traumatic event, like a heart, like a, a car accident or some very traumatic uh, event. Um, it's also known, this broken heart syndrome is also known as Takotsubu's or a stress cardiomyopathy. Um, what happens is the heart, you go in having very similar symptoms of a heart attack. And when they do, uh, they, your heart enzymes are elevated, your heart muscle is very weak. And then they look and they can't find any blockages and they realize, oh, this thing was precipitated by a very stressful event. And, you know, over time it can get better. It's um, usually it re it's reversible. It gets, it gets better within a month. It's thought to be caused by a rapid release of that adrenaline and noradrenaline when we're under a stressful situation. So not only can stress over time, chronic stress can cause heart disease and heart attacks, but a rapid stressor that's unusual can actually cause acute heart failure. Interestingly enough, it's more common in middle-aged women. They're not sure why. They think maybe it's a caught loss of the estrogen benefit after menopause. And I don't want you to get worried that you can, this can happen all the time. It's a fairly rare occurrence. About 2% of all heart attacks are thought to be caused by this um, event, this broken heart syndrome. And like I said, it's usually precipitated by a very stressful event. Next slide, please. The other thing we should talk about is stress can cause arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are irregular heart rhythms. Why can that happen? Well, with stress, ad adrenaline rises. Adrenaline increases heart rate. When you're under stress, you ever stand in front of a group of people who need to talk and your heart starts racing? Well, that's your adrenaline at work. It also focuses us, but it causes our heart to race. But with that elevated adrenaline, um, our heart rate goes up and it can increase the risk of an arrhythmia. We can also get more palpitations and more heartbeat awareness. But for people that are at risk for uh, significant arrhythmias, people with already known heart disease that have weakened heart muscle, um, these are spikes of adrenaline can increase their risk of having dangerous heart arrhythmias. So that's another aspect to the stress that, you know, the last two I just talked about, the arrhythmia and the broken heart syndrome are unusual. They're not under chronic stress, but these are the, the yeah, uh, for more acute stress response, but we were more at getting into chronic stress. Next slide. So getting back to chronic stress and how it plays in cardiac health, we all should be aware of cardiac risk fire factors. There's some stuff that we just can't do anything about. We're going to get older. Some of us are men. We're more likely to be Men are more likely to have heart disease. Certain races are more predisposed to heart disease. If you have immuno, autoimmune diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, you, unfortunately, those people are more at risk. And also people with a history of complicated pregnancies. We can't do anything about that. But we do have some modifiable risk factors. And you'll see at the bottom of that list says stress smoking, alcohol, poor diet, diabetes, overweight, physical inactivity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. But stress is real. Stress impacts your risk of cardiovascular disease. And a lot of times we just shrug our shoulders and say, well, 
you know, it is what it is, but we have to work harder at modifying the stress in our life if we can. Um, one way to do that is, first of all, reducing stress is eating better. Eating better can be considered anti-inflammatory. So food is medicine. We should avoid processed foods, things that, you know, have a lot of preservatives, high in trans fat, high sodium. Eating as close to the earth as possible. Concentrating on things that are vegetables, lean proteins, plant-based proteins, low-fat dairy. Mediterranean-style diet works. It lowers that inflammation that we get when we're under stress. And like I said, these foods are naturally um, anti-inflammatory. And remember, this is the only body you have. So you want to put into it the best quality stuff that we can. It's easy to go. It's easier just to go pick up stuff and, you know, like fast food because it's more stressful to cook. But sometimes it it does matter. I know that... Um, we're, I know we'll talk about exercise in the next lecture, but exercise is so essential for so many reasons. The current guidelines suggest 30 minutes a day, about 150 minutes a week. You should try to exercise at most days of the week. Moderate intensity, you don't have to go to Orange Theory. You know, just getting out there and walking briskly. Um, try for, you can still talk, but you just can't sing. That's a good uh guideline. Your goal heart rate is somewhere about 180 minus your age. So if you're older, you don't have to get it up as high. Um, just being less sedentary during the day, 30% reduction in death and heart attack risk. If you can stand, just don't stand rather than sitting, walk rather than calling or emailing or texting. Now with COVID around, we are much more, a lot of time during that phase, we've got a lot more sedentary because we weren't, weren't going into the office. So remember trying to get that uh, daily exercise in there because that lowers blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol, all the things that stress elevate. Um, moderate intensity exercise mobilizes immune cells. So it improves the immune system actually. Um, improves bones and muscles, less osteoporosis in people that exercise. And it also combats depression and it combats stress as well. We know that people that exercise have lower over time, the, those stress hormones. Um, when you exercise, your heart rate goes up, but you enjoy a lower heart rate afterwards. Next slide, please. Just so for, for because I'm a cardiologist, the numbers to know. Um, your total cholesterol should be under 200 ideally. Your good cholesterol, which is the HDL, should be above 60. Your bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, think lousy, ideally should be under 100 um, or under 70 if you do have coronary disease. Your triglycerides should typically be under 150. Blood Normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. I'm not saying you're going to start on medications if your blood pressure is higher than that, but knowing that your blood, ideally your blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. Um, sugar should be less than 100. Exercise, like we said, and your BMI, which is your body mass index, um, should be less than 25. And how you calculate that, you can go online, but it's basically your weight and your height. It's not an ideal thing, but we th that's the best we have currently. So we're talking about keeping a healthy weight. Next slide, please. I thought this made me giggle um, because I just was on vacation. I was out in Arizona and, and it's true. She was on vacation for three weeks, but burned up upon re-entry. We do take vacation and we feel much better, but then we come back and we have all this stuff that we have to do. We have to catch up on. We never seem to get a break. It's, it's, we're always constantly on. We are, our cell phones make everything accessible to us. So, you know, people, we're never off. We're always having to be responsive to people. And if we're not, people get upset. So trying to find a niche where you take care of yourself is vitally important because unfortunately, as I used to, I like to say to people, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first because you can't, you're not going to be helpful to other people. This chronic daily stress elevates blood pressure, elevates cholesterol, it causes disease, and it also lowers the quality of your life. You can enjoy yourself. And we know that translates into real disease physically. Um, so remember, heart disease is the number one killer of people worldwide. 80% of cardiovascular disease is preventable. And many of those risk factors are influenced by chronic stress that is very hard to manage. And we have to figure that out. And hopefully somebody has some good ideas and we'll have a conversation about what we think might work. And what you do matters. And um, 
more than just for you because we're the care. Many of us are women in this audience and we're the caregivers. So we have to be healthy and just move more, eat better and laugh as much as you can. Hopefully that's a start for um, stress reduction. Um, and that is what I have for today. I'm going to move it over to um, our next um, lecturer because I know that he has a lot of probably great ideas on how to manage stress. Um, so thank you, Dr. Cusack, and thank you, Pam and Vanessa, and I just want to share a quick study. Um, basically, they were looking at college students, and they split them into two groups. They looked at um, uh, uh, the students that were on spring break, and then they looked at students who were in the middle of final exams, and they did the same intervention for both students, and that was a small cut in the same location, a small cut, and they measured healing times. And they found that there was statistically significant healing times in the group of students who were on spring break compared to those who uh, were in the middle of final exam. So there's definitely no doubt that stress and physical health and healing are directly correlated to one another. And I see that all the time in the physical therapy clinic. Um, and uh, so there's definitely uh, a correlation. Um, so in the, in the next slide that I have, entitled Physical Activity and Managing Stress and Heart Health. There's two studies I also want to share. Uh, I have a hand, handful of studies. Um, the first one is from the British Journal of Health Psychology, published in 2019, and they found that engaging in physical activity is related to better mood and less stress with uh, um, less negative affect over the next several hours in their daily life. And just an easy way if someone is feeling down just to engage in physical activity, to go for a walk, to do some light aerobic exercise. It's really amazing how quickly that can make a difference. So um, I encourage anyone that is experiencing any of this, if they have the opportunity to just get moving. Uh, movement is medicine and uh, it really can affect the way someone feels. Um, another study I'd like to share is from the Harvard Alumni Health Study, uh, published in 2000. And uh, uh, yep, yeah, this slide. And the total, and they found total physical activity and vigorous activities showed the strongest reduction in coordinated heart disease risk. And I know Dr. Cusack was talking about moderate intensity um, exercises. And it, for some people, if they're healthy enough and the doctor says they're good, vigorous activity may also be beneficial. Um, and uh, so either one of those, the guidelines for moderate or vig vigorous activity, um, are definitely beneficial for heart health and stress reduction. So I want to share a few relaxation techniques. Um, um, so I took um, uh, some classes in anatomy and exercise physiology, but I must say one of my favorite classes was called stress and health. And it really affected the way that I realized perception of an event can really change stress that someone feels and then the physical ramifications that come. So two people can observe the same event. One person might feel good about it, another person may not, and their, their, their perception of the stress and the physical manifestation can be totally different for the same event. So, so our perception and our outlook have a strong effect on our bodies and our health. Um, so there's meditation. Um, um, that's one that we're going to discuss today. There's many different ways of relaxing in a healthy way. And meditation is something we're going to explore together. There's also yoga. There's hatha yoga, vinyasa yoga, ashtanga. Um, there's many different types. And there's also group fitness classes. Um, there's music therapy, just an easy way to listen, pleasant, to listen to pleasant music. And it really has a profound effect. Um, uh, there's Tai Chi, Qigong, massa excuse me, massage therapy for um, people uh, that feel benefit from that as well. Diaphragmatic breathing, which may also be coupled with meditation, which we'll explore uh, in a little bit. And then physical exercise, of course, and nutrition um, and uh, progressive muscle relaxation, mental imagery. Some people do guided imagery or visualization and then ecotherapy. And I love the picture to the right. It's always nice to just um, be humbled by nature, to be outdoors, to breathe fresh air and just to observe nature as a way of relaxing. So um, I want to go, before we do our meditation practice in a little bit, um, 
I want to just review some history for anyone who's interested in meditation. Um, it originates um, in Asia and in, in India in the 6th century BC from the Hindu Vedas. Um, it's deeply rooted in a combination of Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Uh, meditation became popular in the 1960s uh, with the Beatles and the counterculture movement. Uh, to the right, there's a picture of them visiting Maharishi. Um, and uh, the medical profession has begun to study and take seriously uh, the benefits of uh, meditation and mindfulness, I might add. There's, there's really three, maybe four different types of meditation I want to offer um, to, uh, for anyone who's interested in exploring different styles of meditation. There's Zen meditation, which I think is probably the best for beginners. Zen meditation is a form of meditation where one learns to detach from their own thoughts. They're still observing the thoughts, but they're detached. They try to create distance or layers within themselves. So the mind is still going, but they're really trying to observe it from a further perspective and not necessarily act on them instantly, but really try to create distance and really uh, distance themselves from their immediate feelings and thoughts and just observe from a further perspective. That's basically Zen meditation. Um, and then the next slide shows that there's an emphasis on observation. Um, it's it's um, observing the mind. And so many people I've heard so often, they say, oh, I don't know if I can do meditation. I don't know if it's right for me. I can't sit. I can't focus. My mind is always racing. And Zen is perfect for this population. Uh, Zen meditation, let the mind go. Let it there. There is, you let the mind go, let it race, let it go wherever it wants to go. There is no wrong uh, part of meditation. Let it be free. The part of Zen is to let it be free and then to observe it from a further perspective within the self. Um, so that's really the emphasis on Zen is be as you are, um, but you're really mindfully detaching from those thoughts and feelings, even though they continue to flow freely. Um, the next meditation, and I am not a transcendental meditation instructor. I know they have a special training program, but I have gathered general information, which I like to share. Um, transcendental meditation was developed um, uh, by Maharishi, and um, basically the emphasis is on a mantra. Um, I really like the image to the right because I think it's a good visual. So a mantra. It's, uh, it's sometimes the meditation instructor provides a mantra for the students, but I don't think that's necessarily necessary for my opinion. Um, it could be any mantra. Uh, there's OM, O-M is a yoga mantra which has been used for many years. Um, it could be love, it could be any thought that you'd like to focus on. But the, what's interesting about transcendental meditation is that it really doesn't matter, from my perspective, it doesn't matter what the mantra is. They're all going to take an individual to the same destination. And the idea is that someone repeats the mantra to themselves, and they just keep repeating the mantra. And I, it's like the analogy of stepping into an elevator and taking the elevator as deep down into the body as someone can go, into the subconscious, into the mind, wherever you want to go. But you step into the elevator and you continue the mantra as deeply as you can go. And inevitably, there's going to be times of uncomfortableness, fidgetiness, wanting to leave, wanting to exit. This is where the challenge begins. This is where, with transcendental you take it as far as you feel comfortable going. And the struggle is part of the process. And the struggle helps someone get deeper than they would otherwise go. And oftentimes, they feel much more differently afterwards, having gone deeper into meditation uh, than they would have otherwise done. And I also, I practice this, and it helps me for focus. I, I, you know, I'll time myself and I'll stay focused. And I, it really has carried over into other aspects of my life. So that's transcendental is if you like focus, if you want to kind of improve uh, your persistence, if you like a challenge, then grab a mantra and hop on the elevator and take it to as far as deep as you can go and then step off 
And when, this, when you step off, you'll find yourself in a different headspace, feeling differently than when you started. Um, and then another thing the next slide will show is that um, not only is it a mental repetition of a mantra, but also they use imagery. They might be a sound. Sometimes they chant OM or they repeat OM. And there might be um, physical, uh, they might be breathing in a pattern wall, they say, their mantra. And they might even have tactile feedback. They might feel um, a tactile feedback, which reminds them of the mantra. So they are multi-sensory experiencing this meditation, um, which helps someone go deeper into the practice. So they're saying OM, they're feeling OM, and they're really taking the practice as far as they, they can go. And it's really a challenge to take it, you know, they say 10, 15 minutes would be great. Um, but as far as you can go, you're going to have profound effects. Um, especially if you go farther than you would otherwise go. <laughs> um, all right. The third one I want to share is one of my favorites. It's probably my number one favorite one. Uh, and this is the chakra meditation. Um, so basically along the midline of the body, straight down the center of the body, there's different areas um, and um, different um, organs, there's different muscles, there's different tissue, different bones, and one can take this as metaphysically, um, as, meta as metaphysical as they would like or not. They can be literal. Sometimes I'm a little more literal, like how does a particular area feel down the body or up the body, um, or there's also other associations with the chakras. So a chakra is a Sanskrit word, which means spinning wheel. It aligns from the crown of the head to the base of the spine, the entire midline of the body throughout the whole center. And uh, it's associated with various endocrine glands and tissues. Um, and um, what I really like about the, the chakra meditation is it's a checklist for me. So I feel like I'm only as healthy as my weakest chakra. So if there was like a flow of energy throughout the body, wherever there's blockage, I'm only as strong as my weakest link. And so the chakra meditation is a good checklist where I can kind of clear the system from the ground up or from the top down and just check into every part of the body and just see, can I feel it? Can I feel what's going on in this area or not? Sometimes I don't and I have to settle into the space, breathe into the space, and just have extra time for mindfulness until I can actually feel something. Um, and other times, it's just straight through. And I found the more I do it, the easier it gets. Um, so it's really just observation. Um, and then the next one, if you do like not only the physical, but also the metaphysical parts, there are different associations with the chakra. Um, the crown chakra is spirituality, uh, maybe divinity, uh, a little bit beyond the body itself. The third eye chakra is associated with wisdom. Um, sometimes I just meditate in the mind, in the brain. I feel what that is like. Um, there's the throat chakra, also associated with being able to express oneself, how they feel. Um, there's the heart chakra about love, uh, the solar plexus about self-respect, the sacral chakra about sexuality and the root chakra, which is about safety. And once again, we're only as good as our weakest link, I feel. And so it's always good to check through the systems, attune at least for a little bit into each one of them, just to make sure that we're okay and that everything is flowing smoothly. And then, so I listed the three, Zen, Transcendental, and Chakra. And I know it may be, a, some new information for some people if you're hearing for the first time. But I also want to share one more that I just recently learned about that I'm doing uh, to this day. And I like it. And it's very simple. So this last slide is just a recap of the different chakras uh, that, we've, um, that we've explored. There's the Zen, which is observation and it's non-judgment. It's really good for beginners and just let the mind go. If there's tons of thoughts and they're racing all the time, that's fine. 
That's great. In Zen, no problem. Let the mind be free. The emphasis with Zen is really to detach from the thoughts and feelings and to see if someone can observe them from a further perspective, almost as if someone is watching a movie. Um, the detachment of the observation, that's Zen. Um, the next one is transcendental, where you have a mantra, it could be Om, it could be love, and that is just repeated. And sometimes someone might feel um, a reminder of that, they might repeat it, and they really just go as deeply as they can. Five minutes will make a difference, 10 minutes, uh, you know, 20 is great. <laughs> and then chakra, chakra is the checklist. I like, I typically do, Either way, from the bottom up or the top down, but to tune into each part of the body and to really just clear the system. And there's a checklist and just clear the system. And then the last one I wanted to share, which is one I learned recently, is very simple. It's a four and a half second inhale. And there's a four and a half second exhale. And that's it. And that pace is slow enough to really slow the body down and get it to relax. So we're going to do a practice session. So, you know, I want you to loosen up, be kind of be free, let the body move just a little bit, because we're going to spend a little bit of time um, with, uh, with a practicing, uh, because the proof is in the pudding. And the last thing I'll say about the meditation is it's free. It doesn't cost anything. It is free. Evidence suggests that it works. It's beneficial, and there's no harmful side effects that I'm aware of. I don't know of anyone getting injured after meditating. So it's very rare to find an intervention which works, that's free, and has no harmful side effects. So this is one of the very few gems that we have. And so for all the listeners that are ready to practice their own mantra or their own style of meditation, I'll do a quick recap. I want you to choose your favorite one. So you can do Zen meditation, where you sit back, relax, let the mind be free, and just observe the thoughts. You can do a transcendental, where you choose your unique mantra, and you repeat that to yourself throughout the entire time. And the last one is you can do a, a scan through the body, through the midline, from the top down or the bottom up, and just check all the areas down the center of the body. Make sure you can feel everything. Make sure you can breathe into the space uh, and just to be aware of each spot, each area. So I want you, and then the last one, if that wasn't enough information, four and a half second in, four and a half second out. All right, so I've got the clock. I don't want you to look at the clock if possible, because I want you to feel the experience and notice how it feels for yourself. So we're going to start our meditation practice. I have my singing bowl right here, and it's going to start at the beginning. I want you to stay in the practice as long as you can. And then I'm going to hit the mindfulness meditation bowl, and then I want you to relax and return back to as you are. So during the time between the bell ringing, stay in the practice as much as you can. So sit up nice and tall, feel your feet grounded through the floor, feel the sit bones in the chair, belly in, nice and tall through the top of the body, uh, top of the head, nice and tall, bring the shoulder blades gently together, head back, chin down, time for meditation.
So I'd like to congratulate you if you made it through, especially if you didn't look at the time. And my first question for you is how long did that feel? Um, and the time was five minutes. So if that felt longer than five minutes, that's great. Um, um, or not, it really doesn't matter, but that's how much it took. It takes five minutes to really feel a change. Uh, 10 minutes is even, even more pleasant. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to do it. And the only thing I would say is when you are, if you do time yourself, I prefer a stopwatch method where you're counting up the time as opposed to a timer where you're counting down the time. I think it's just a little more pleasant to just see progress over time if you are timing yourself. Um, but I do encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to consider a daily mindfulness practice, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening, but five minutes is all it takes um, uh, with any meditation that you like uh, to really have a noticeable difference. Um, so with that, I, um, uh, I yield back the remainder of my time. I just want to say I really enjoyed that, John, and I think what you said really resonated with me in my own practice. Uh, we've seen this very much in cardiology where type A personalities, people that are under a lot of stress, truly do have higher rates of disease. And I've also seen patients that have partaken in stress reduction, such as meditation, yoga, all of those things, exercise. And I've seen a tremendous difference um, in their blood pressure control and their cholesterol. You know, it's hard to gauge like whether or not they're going to have a reduction in cardiac events just simply because it's hard to do that study in an individual. But we definitely have seen the studies in large scale populations with stress reduction, as you uh, alluded to uh, with the, the wound healing. So um, I think it's really something in medicine that is underappreciated or under discussed, I would say. I think we all appreciate it. We talk about it, but we're never quite sure how to really address it in our daily um, taking care of patients. And you have to just sort of step back a little bit and take time for yourself. Um, vitally important. And I think, as you said, meditation is one of the easiest ways to do it. It's free and there is no downside to it. Um, and I actually have never tried, I always used to say the same thing. Meditation for me was always like, ah, I can't do it. But that, oh, the one with, for the beginners, I was like, wait a minute, I can do this. And I did it while you were doing it. I'm like, wow. And it did make me feel much more centered and calm when we were done with the five minutes. So I thank you for that, for bringing that into my life. Thank you. You're welcome. And also, yes, thank you. And also, thank you, you know, and, um, and I encourage, we are the practitioners and the clinicians that encourage this type of activity. And it's always helpful to have help and support to facilitate someone along the process. And that's why these sessions are so great uh, with the HSS education program that we yeah. can deliver material to some people that can benefit from it. And if you feel that way, please share your feedback uh, and reach out to Pam and Vanessa if you'd like to. So, and thank you for sharing, Dr. Definitely. And I can, um, in the post-program email, we'll also share, um, we offer programs virtually in Tai Chi, and we actually have a new music therapy program um, that um, it goes on a regular basis. So happy to share programs that are helpful in reducing stress, managing heart health, and also keeping your joints healthy. Well, I think we have a couple of questions here. Um, I appreciate the explanation of weight gain and stress. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And it's real. It is real. Um, you see it all the time. You, and you now know there's a physiologic response to that. I mean, the, the uh, cortisol and all and the glucagon and the insulin resistance. It, you know, now we feel like, okay, now I get it. And I think there's one uh, for John as well. Yeah. You said something about adding a what? I think just if there's anything you would incorporate to the, to the meditation regimen. Like oh. Um, I find less is more, to be honest. I don't want to be dependent on anything in order to do a practice. So like if I don't have my app, I don't have this or that, I can't do it. I want it to really be, you don't need anything. You can be 
doing whatever you'd like to, and you can have some sort of meditation. And that's actually where mindfulness comes into play, where mindfulness is somewhat of a moving meditation. Someone could be walking to work and they're mindfully breathing. Uh, that's more of a mindfulness type of meditation. Um, so less is more. However, if you are interested in accessories, I do have, I'm not selling it, but I do have, you know, the yoga bowl is nice. Uh, it's a good <laughs> meat, which, um, you know, creates, I like, I call it a block, a golden block of time where but in that space of meditation, nothing is going to interrupt you. It, you create a safe space where your colleagues or friends or family know you're in a, a, your, your unique room or whichever space you dedicate for mindfulness and you, you're uh, reminded of to facilitate the practice even more. Um, so I do like the singing bowl. And then I also, you know, if you want to keep track, uh, if you want to really develop your practice uh, and progress longer term, maybe, you know, 15, 20 minute practice, a stopwatch might be helpful if you'd like, but not essential or necessary. And John, I was, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just actually even thinking about what John was saying. Um, about the health benefits, because I remember many years ago, I don't know if anyone here remembers Diana Reeves, um, uh, Christopher Reeves wife. Does, does anyone here remember her yeah. and how she had to was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer after her husband died? And I can't imagine a more stressful thing than having to care for a man who is completely physically dependent upon you. And we talked about I touched upon the um, the increased risk of um lung cancer in patients that are primary caregivers to Alzheimer's patients, they feel that that's one of the most stressful things you could do in a lifetime is to care for um, uh, Alzheimer's patients because it's full time. And all of these people, she ultimately passed away from small cell lung cancer. So I think we really got to take this seriously. Um, John, I, I think you're your um your get the gifts that you gave us to just simply do this and just be, it matters and i think even a little bit 10 minutes a day five minutes a day i think could really turn your your health around and you know give you that golden time as you talked about without a lot of media of, and, and as you said contraptions and i'm sorry i pam i, I interrupted you no it's perfect i love what you said um i think the other question that may have come through is there a, a suggested time of day that for oh, meditation. Yeah. So morning, afternoon, night, is there any particular benefit to a time of day? John, you Don't probably say, know that better. <laughs> uh, whatever works best for you. Um, as a practitioner advances within their practice, they're going to be mindful throughout the entire day as much as possible. Um, so it'll be from the beginning to the end of the day. Um, however, it's always nice to dedicate in the morning. I find just like a morning exercise. If you really get started well, it kind of carries over the rest of the day. But then also the evening, there could have been a stress during the day to help unwind and kind of settle down. Uh, and it might be nice to meditate in the evening before bed during the normal routine. Um, so anytime, but morning and evening is particularly effective, at least for me as well. Yeah. John, there's usually a cortisol spike in the morning when we wake up. Is there any benefit to doing the meditation in that? I mean, I just don't know if there's any data or any research on that. Um, have you heard anything? That's a great point. And I didn't, um, I, I haven't come across any research um, specifically about the morning cortisol spike um, as it relates to meditation. However, um, it's good to do one way or the other. <laughs> Whatever so, you do. <laughs> um, if you like, if that's your, uh, if that's your practice. Um, so that's what I have for my excellent question. Wonderful. I really appreciate both of your times. Thank you for that oh, wonderful you're presentation. Thank you for everyone joining us. Um, and we look forward to more programs together. So have Great. a wonderful Thank you so evening. much for us. Hey, thank you so much for having us. Of course. Take care. Thank you. You too.